Well, I am so excited to be here. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm looking forward to get to meet everybody <laughs> that signed books. Uh, I am really, honestly, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. I love Baker. Um, this is my our first book together. So this has been super fun. Uh, love Grand Rapids, so excited to be here. Um, I would tell you, I was driving in today and I think um, there, like I have like a will bearing issue. I felt like I was coming in on like three wheels. So I'm very happy that I made it today. <laughs> Uh, probably dealing with that before I leave town. But yeah, just really, really excited to uh, to be here. Is this clock running for real? Okay. Um, and for those joining online as well, so happy to have you. Uh, the book just came out well a week ago, right? So um, so it's very new. And um, so events like this right now just feel really special because it's the first time I've got to share this content in this way. And um, definitely want this to be interactive. We'll have time for. Q and A and that kind of thing. I, I guess a little bit I want to say out of the gate, uh, the road away from God, how love finds us even as we walk away. Um, I really had a, I, I'm so thrilled that Baker was, that you guys have been cool with this title. Because <laughs> I love it knowing it's a stark title. And I know it can seem like a bit of a red herring that this is not in fact like a journey of atheism. I know this really, I've had a few last that it's like the soldiers have, I was like, what, this is true. Exiting Christianity, which of course is really not. That's why it's a great subtitle, which is not my idea. How love finds us even as we walk away. I think it was my, uh, my brilliant editor, Stephanie. But um, this book for me has been a really personal journey and uh, both in terms of my own life, but also so many people that I know and love um, who are walking this kind of, this, this road of disillusionment and despair. Um, it's since such a, I don't know, I always hesitate a little bit in terms of how I speak about time because like everybody thinks their time is unique in some way. But I do feel like we are living in an extraordinary moment in ways that are both positive and negative. And one of those things that we see is um, just so many people uh, kind of in mass right now who are deeply disillusioned with religious systems and structures in particular. And, um, you know, I, not that anybody has said otherwise, but this, this content really is stuff like I believe from my toes. In fact, my last book came out in 2016. I feel like this took me forever to write. It's almost been embarrassing to me because I feel like you understand how I write uh, too. It's, it's very manic and I do this thing of if it doesn't feel exactly right to me from start to finish, then I keep burning it down and starting all the way over until. So I should have like a Dostoevsky size. This feels like it should be 3,000 pages. <laughs> Um, but I don't think it was supposed to be. It felt like there was a real nudge that it needed to be simpler, cleaner, more direct. And part of the reason now I think it's, it, it's take, it took me this long uh, to be able to do is I really think I needed to live more in this journey. I think I just wasn't far enough up the road yet. Um, I have this, this idea, and I don't mean this to say like I'm some great mystic and uh, like whatever, but I do think it's just kind of how God does it, there's this pattern of death and resurrection that's constantly being worked out and everything. So the first uh, book that I wrote was called Prototype and wow, I guess it's like 12 years ago. And it was very much innocence, wonder. I mean, I, I didn't plan it like this, this is how I now. Uh, how to Shop a Shipwreck came out in 2016 and that was very much uh, loss, grief, trauma, failure, descent. So it really wasn't until um, I was well into this that I realized, oh yeah, the third book, this is my resurrection book. And um, I just think it's interesting how that works, that these cycles just kind of work out in our lives. So, um, I, and I know for me personally, I'm, I'm in such an interesting place with this, with this content because my own experience has been, while well, I also have walked the road of, um, well, to use Robert Blass' uh, phrase, ashes, descent, and grief, and that has been personal for me in a lot of ways. Um, at the same time, I'm actually in a place where it really does feel like there's a lot of resurrection, there's a lot of new life, where I'm feeling hopeful, and uh, yet really wanted this book in particular to be a companion for people, no matter where they are on the road. Um, this Emmaus Road story, uh, which for a long time, you know, I, I had a lot of people kind of workshopping I did with friends who told me, I don't know if that work. Can you, can you really hang a whole book on, like we were talking about maybe 12, 13 verses of Luke's gospel. Can you hang a whole book around that? And um, I know I, I could be prone to hyperbole maybe, but I really do feel this way. At this point right now, the, the Emmaus Road story for me contains every story. I just, 
it's unbelievably dense and rich. For me, it's got the fall story and restoration. It's like all the stories are in this story. And one of the things that's been fun actually even about doing this whole tour, the different places I've been speaking at, I don't, I haven't given the same talk twice. And that's not, uh, not necessarily been exactly on purpose because I don't seem to do a lot of things on purpose. It's just more for me, this, this story is just endless. And I feel like every time I look at it, uh, my head breaks open all over again. And it's interesting now how the way I hear bands sometimes talk about, you know, you write a song and then you don't always know what it is if you play on the road. It's really fun right now seeing how this is taking on new life as people start to engage it. Because the, the idea for me really is that this would be a really interactive book. I think my all time literary touchstone for everything is does anybody know the never ending story, the film or the book? It's a great movie in 1984. It's back when they had real puppets and all that. So much better than when everything looks like a video game. Um, but I love that there's this scene in the never ending story. You know, the premise, of course, bashing this young boy who gets this ancient book and finds out that as he goes, that he's a character of the story. And there's this moment, you know, where he throws the book across the room because it's, it's almost too much. Um, I really felt like this needed to be that kind of book that would capture people's experience of this road that often is so lonely and alienating um, in a way that would be comforting, but also maybe a little bit like put it there across the room because it might feel um, a little too real. And, and I think that's part of the reason why it took me so long is I feel like I had, I had to keep going deeper into that, into that experience. Um, probably should be said, so for the, the, the premise for me is essentially this, if you haven't read the book yet, and probably haven't because it's been out for a week. Um, the premise for me is this, uh, and I'll, I'll never forget when this started to work on me from that text. You know, you've got these two disciples, of course. Um, Jesus has just been crucified. So uh, they, and it's an interesting story because they're, they're walking away from Jerusalem to Emmaus, and the text is not clear at all as to exactly why they're going to Emmaus. So perhaps their homes are there. Maybe Emmaus is along, the, is along the road somewhere. What we know for sure, I think, is that Jerusalem in this text serves as its theological home. It's where the temple is. It's where their sense of home, stability, uh, orientation, everything for them is bound up in the place of Jerusalem. So when you think about Jerusalem being, um, for a Jewish person, this is the center of the universe. And now this place that's been a sacred space, it's a place where the temple is, is where they've seen Jesus of Nazareth uh, tortured and killed. Now the sacred space is no longer a safe space. Uh, it's a crime scene. There's yellow tape around it. And so I, I think the idea, I don't think I'm reading too much into this. I think this is, this is really there. As they take off from Jerusalem, thinking that Jesus is dead, for them, um, this is the road away from God. Um, so they're walking away from the temple, away from the institution, away from the place that was home before. Um, having, I mean, you know, there's that, of course, there's all kinds of wonderful kind of dark humor in the story. I love that Jesus, of course, starts walking alongside them and they don't know that it's Jesus. This is actually one of my favorite exchanges in the Gospels because uh, it talks about how they, you know, he asked them, you know, why they're, they're so sad. And Cleopas says, you know, clearly kind of exasperated, are you the only one in Jerusalem who has heard about what's happened, as in what's happened in the torture and crucifixion of Jesus? So he's asking the person who has, you know, the nails, the nail prints in his hands and feet and all that, are you the only person who hasn't heard about this? And, uh, and what I think is true, the most comic reply in the, in the New Testament, Jesus' timing here is fantastic. Jesus' response is, what things? Like, whatever do you mean? So, something has happened? Please tell me more. Um, it's a fantastic moment. But the, the irony of the story is thinking that Jesus, you know, he's, well, he can't be the Messiah now because he's been crucified. Um, in their minds, it's a walk away from God, not knowing that God is actually walking alongside them. And that's, of course, the beautiful surprise of the story is them coming to this moment of recognition where finally they're able to see that um, the God they thought they were walking away from is actually walking alongside of them. And so my hope for this, and, you know, at, at this point in my life, I'm not, 
I try to be realistic about what's happening in the world. I'm not, I'm not trying to be glass half full. I really don't mean this as like optimism. It's, just, it's what I deeply believe that as a person who loves the church, as a product of the church, is still involved in building these kinds of Christian communities, I'm actually not freaking out about this shift away from um, institution, even though I feel like, you know, church does great good in so many lives, because I'm just this confident that in, in how the road works. And sometimes if I can say it this way, I think sometimes you actually have to leave Jerusalem to get to Jesus. <laughs> it's like the, um, doesn't mean the sacred space is bad. Actually, and I, um, I even make this claim in the book because I was a little concerned about this, that it could sound like a critique of Judaism, like, like, like Judaism believes that it's all in the temple. And I, I don't think I don't, that'd be fair. Uh, the truth is, I think that this story is in the Hebrew story. Um, it's in the Christian story. I think this is actually how mature religion works, is you can't really choose it until you have a, a chance not to choose it. That until there's a, that moment of kind of being able to walk away, I think that's actually when um, this becomes people's own road. So um, I, my sense of it is I don't really feel like, it's like oh, there's necessarily everybody's breaking away from God. I think people are leaving certain kinds of sacred spaces. And, you know, the truth is I'm, I'm a great fan of sacred spaces. I mean, I'm, if you don't know my background, so um, I am a son of a Pentecostal preacher. My grandfather also is a Pentecostal minister. So all that's very much in my blood. We have our own kind of sacred spaces. A little more sweat and sawdust than, you know, like, like cathedrals. But the truth is I love sacred spaces. I love, I have wonderful memories of, of the churches that I grew up in. Uh, love, like, you know, church, synagogue, cathedral. I love, I mean, when I'm traveling, I love to go in these kinds of spaces. So the idea is not that sacred spaces are bad, but I do think the trouble with sacred spaces is over time, people come to think that their sacred space is the only place where God is. And oftentimes the way that you find out that God is places other than your own sacred space is you feel pushed out of it in some way. And that's what I love about this story is this idea of as they're walking away from the temple, as they're walking away from what in a religious sense have been home for them, been a spiritual home, that now there's this opportunity to actually encounter God in the wild, if I could put it that way. I played with that language more than I actually used it in the beginning, and I was afraid it was going to feel like a John Eldridge book. It's like, it's like, like you know, like, it, which, which, that's great, but it's not like, you know, this isn't sort of like, all right, men, let's take off our shirts and go in the woods, have a retreat, or like, whatever it is that you do. Like, but I do think there's something that's beautiful about this notion of encountering God in the, in the wild. And it's, it's the journey that I'm living, and it's what I'm seeing with so many other people, too. Um, Part of it for me is just coming to really believe that, uh, because I do believe in this God who's revealed in Jesus, that one of the things I found myself saying a lot in the last week or so, um, and I don't want to give too many disclaimers, but it's like it's, it, it is a kind of a tightrope to walk because I think part of what makes this road what it is, is again, you kind of have to follow it all the way through. You have to follow where it leads. So what I'm not trying to do is tell people who don't feel like they're in a place where they're able to trust, you must trust, you must believe. And if you don't, Jesus will stalk you down this road. He will haunt you down this road. God hunting you down that. That's not the idea at all. Um, it's more like for me, if God is love and love is the center of mystery, then I think we've got to give people room to go on these kind of journeys. And one of the things I think we see consistently through all these wonderful stories that Jesus tells in the Gospels, I think about the story of the prodigal son. He, the father in this story knows that the son is going to misspend the inheritance. Uh, it's incredibly insulting, all those kinds of things. But he still gives it to him because the idea is, you know, I think that's what elders do is they give us permission to go on the journey. So that's part of the line I'm trying to walk here in a way that's gentle is both to give people a sense of permission to be wherever they are on the road, but also to tell very transparently and vulnerably my own experience of the road, which, you know, for me, and um, there, there continues to be a lot of happy surprises in this way. I do feel like I have these really, um, I'm having these really rich experiences of the risen Jesus on the road. And it's fun to be able to talk about that the way I'm right now, 
where there's no sense of defensiveness. And I'm not really trying to talk anybody in, into anything. Um, I have a, I hope it's funny, but a funny little riff in the book at some point about like apologetics because and I don't think apologetics are all bad. I'm sure it's wonderful apologetics books in the store, but the kind of apologetics, you know, like who, and I understand there's that verse of Peter, you know, about that being able to give people reason for the hope that we have. It doesn't actually say anything about arguing people into your belief system. And I just personally have never found a lot of the kind of apologetics I hear. I just don't actually find them compelling. Uh, I, I was at a church uh, earlier in my life where they did like a, a couple day apologetic seminar and it's this whole 10 ways to prove the Bible is true without using the scripture. And uh, you know, the whole idea is like when you're, uh, when you have a conversation with your heathen neighbor, as you're prone to do, uh, then inevitably you're going to have this interaction that there's, there's got to be like a script for it. Like you're going to try to tell them the truth and they're going to say, well, that might be your truth, but that's not my truth. I don't believe in absolute truth. And then you say, aha, you say you don't believe in absolute truth. Isn't that an absolute truth? Mind blown. Then they fall to their knees in repentance and all of a sudden um, we're a follower of Jesus. Everything. You know, like that's kind of, I feel like that's, that's how a lot of apologetics like feel to me. And um, so I, I didn't want to do that, but I do want to give kind of my own testimony of, yeah, like, yeah, I, I continue to have these surprises of the risen Jesus on, on the road. Um, part of the reason that that's so fascinating for me is that I grew up in a tradition where these kind of experiences of God were so, you know, something that we really sought. And now I find it pretty hilarious that at the time of my life, when I feel like I was the most pious and the most devout and kind of doing all the right things so far as I knew that those experiences were elusive for me and now I feel like I'm at a place where I know I'm not good enough pious enough life's had too many turns all the things and now that I'm not looking for them I feel like I have those kind of experiences all the time <laughs> but I think there's there's been something wonderful for me about the nature of the spiritual life in that way I think um no, it's like uh, God does appear on the road that you're walking. So um, kind of coming around to say, I hope that the book does give people a sense of permission uh, to walk where they need to walk and to explore the questions honestly, and yet also to give a vision for what I think it can look like to encounter God, this God who's revealed in Jesus on uh, on the road to encounter him in, in unexpected places and forms i really actually think the q a part of this um, is going to be um is the part i'm most looking forward to so i want to mind my time but part of my my sense of this and uh this i'm having such a good time with this whole idea right now like so the way that resurrection happens and we see this consistently in these post-resurrection encounters with jesus jesus always comes in a form in which people don't recognize him. That's, you know, Mary uh, by the, the garden tomb uh, in a story like this. No one ever recognizes Jesus at first. And um, that's part of, for me, is, the, is, is the, the beauty of this, is this idea that resurrection's already happened, but we don't see it because the new life comes in a form that's so different from what our expectations would be. That's one of the reasons why I'm not especially cynical about where people are on the road. Is like, well, the resurrected Christ is on this road. A lot of folks just haven't come to this moment of recognition, but it happens. And I hope that part of what the book will do will at least kind of open people up to the possibility of these kinds of surprises, um, the surprise of new life in very unexpected places and uh, through unexpected people. And that's part of the grace of it too. Um, you know, I think about, I've, this, this is not in the book, it's very, and, and very personal, but something I thought about just in the last, the last bit here, as I am recently and very happily married, uh, I had to thank you for that. <laughs> That's her time. She's amazing, and uh, I think she's probably watching. Nicole, I love you. So um, I had this a few years ago. I had a friend who I really trust, who's I hate to say gifted in prayer, but you know what I mean. Like it's just the, he was, has this real sense of connection with the Holy Spirit, and in praying over me kind of gave me this word, if I can use that language, about being a father. And I don't have biological kids. So I, that landed in a really tender place. It's like, oh, like I'm, I didn't think that was necessarily something I was missing. And then it's like, that landed real deep. It was kind of, okay. So 
like when I heard that, I wouldn't have thought about the idea that those four kids already exist in the world. <laughs> because now uh, I get to be a stepdad to four kids um, that were already here. That would not be the form in which I would have expected resurrection. And I, that, that to me is the kind of surprise we get on this sort of Emmaus road is that God comes to us in forms that are so different from our expectations. Um, one of the things I'm trying to say to people, again, very gently right now, because I don't mean this to be so much like a power of positive thinking, click your heels together three times. I actually kind of hate all that. I, I don't, um, it, it drives me as crazy in the kind of word of faith circles and from my charismatic world or sort of new agey, whatever, this idea that so long as you think it hard enough, you can actualize it. Or, I just find all that to be very stressful. Like, how do you know when you believed hard enough? Like, am I, if I get to 74% sincerity, does that make it happen? I just, that, that, that really stresses me out. Um, so I really don't mean it like kind of in, in that spirit, but I just think there's this way that um, very naturally and, and very organically, when you're not trying too hard, like, that, like to make it true, but just open your eyes. Uh, that's what happens in the story. Jesus, uh, it's over a meal with the stranger that there's this moment of recognition. Like, oh God, Jesus was here all along. And that's kind of my, my prayer for a lot of people right now is instead of this kind of like, oh, what, let's get the miracle. Uh, what would it look like for God to open our eyes in such a way to be able to see what's already happened and is happening already from a different point of view? Because I think that's what resurrection does. We see the world as we're living in it right here, right now, from a different perspective. So all of a sudden, it's like, oh, the stranger is not just a stranger. Or in uh, Mary Madeline's case, the garden is not just a garden. Um, bread and wine is not just bread and wine comes for us the, the body and blood of Jesus like all these things so um that's that's more what I'm really hoping the book does um I'm sorry I feel like if I, it's probably drinking from a fire hydrant right now I don't want to open this up um in just a second for questions but I tell you one of the things I think really pushed me to to write about these things at all um I realized that as there is a lot of shift happening religiously and spiritually in the world right now I realized that there are some resources that I really love and I found helpful that names that in kind of a sociological way. Like here's what's happening in terms of beliefs and faith systems and churches and like yeah, sociological critique can be good. Um, but I felt like I was having a hard time kind of finding those resources for me that both name that reality, but then also really speak like straight into my soul in a way that's really uh, that's really life giving, and so that's at least what I'm attempting to do here is name some of the things that everybody's feeling and experiencing, but also really hoping that for some folks it will be a kind of um, a kind of awakening. The best, the most encouraging things I've heard about this from anybody, and I've had a handful of people in my life who I know well and care about, and actually were heavy on my heart um, in writing all this. Not like in a sense of you know. There's someone in this crowd of 5,000 people with back pain. I'm like, well, <laughs> probably there is, you know, like that's really, that's not the spirit of it. It was spirit, but like, like trying to make it for them, but there's heavy in my heart. And to get feedback from people who said like, that they felt really seen and known on the road, or I've really disengaged from faith and church for a couple of years now, but, but I felt something in this and I felt connected to something. Um, that's, Nothing could be more to me than that, than for people to have that kind of experience in, in reading it. And I know that's not something that I can engineer or manufacture, um, but I do hope the book is a bit of an invitation in that way for people to see the ways that, that God is at work in their lives already. Because I just, I just believe it. If you don't, other, what I feel like happens way too often, I know this has never been, um, this has never been helpful for me, when I am in a place of despair, doubt, disillusionment, like whatever. The mentality I always go to is, well, what did I do wrong to get me in this place? So then you have all the endless, what if I made this turn and not that? Uh, what if I would have, uh, what if I've made this decision and not that decision? Which I don't know about how that works for you, but for me, that's always just a sense of chaos. I and mean, that just goes into infinity. 
the beautiful thing about the Emmaus Road story is, is, is a very different question. Where is God on the road that you're already walking? And I just think it, that's a much more helpful way of, of looking at our own lives is instead of all this, all that kind of diagnostic, hey, no, God is on the road that you're walking. This, this is not controversial. This is, you know, David, uh, even if I make my bed in hell, you are there. Take on the winds of the morning, fly to the rest of the we, we know God is on whatever road that you're on. So what would it look like to, to engage that question, where is God on the road that I'm already walking? That's just way more interesting to me than trying to get people back to some place that they left. Um, if especially, you know, the, that's part of the power for me of this kind of journey. And um, again, I feel like I'm saying a lot of things, but uh, you know, when I started, I realized that about the first half of the book was, I, that was so in me. I had a sense of what I wanted to say, but I really, I got deep into writing uh, when I realized, oh man, because I, I know at the end of the story, the disciples do come back to Jerusalem, that I hadn't really thought through this, well, what does it look like to go home? Or, you know, maybe the ancient question, is it possible to go back home? And I, and I, I kind of didn't know where that question was going to take me. Um, my sense of it now is, I don't think anybody ever exactly goes back. I think there's a way of coming full circle, and disciples do. But coming full circle is not the same thing as going back. They're, they're very different people from this road than they were when they left. So I'm, I've essentially tried to just give up on the business of trying to shame anybody back to their Jerusalem and uh, more like it, try to get come alongside and raise this question of, you know, hey, like what, what would it look like to find a sense of home now? And maybe it doesn't mean going back exactly where you were, at least not in the same way. Uh, for some people, maybe, maybe it does. But this whole idea of like really the, the longing for home, the, the search for home, I think that could look very different for for different people. So anyway, I, I want to open this up in here in just a second, but I, I'm hoping that there's room to walk all these kinds of paths within within the book. And for people who are already, uh, you know, people of faith or for people, it's, it's been kind of fun for me even to get some responses from people who don't come from a Christian tradition per se, um, but are finding God to be present on the road in some way to engage the story. That's been really beautiful to me. You know, not, not everybody's been disillusioned in um, some of the kind of churches that, that I come from, uh, but God, God's on those, uh, on those roads as well. Anyway, the, the more interesting part to me is always what happens back and forth. So what questions do you have? Questions, thoughts? So that's your, yes, please. So you had mentioned that you didn't feel like you had lived out the full experience when you got in, and you were just talking about, you know, you got deep into the writing and realized that the road home was still something that you wanted to talk about. Can you talk more about that, just mm. from a journey perspective and even a writing perspective? How did that shift kind of your overall thought process of the book, and what did that look like in your life? Mm. Wow, that's such a great question. I mean, I think part of what it looked like for me, um, I've heard Stanley Howard was say that he figures out what he believes about writing is um, for me, that always is a really spiritual journey. Um, but I think, I think some of what it's looked like for me has been more, and I think this is why it took so long. I'm just always, I don't know if anybody, if you're Enneagram folks, like I'm an Enneagram seven, uh, to put it mildly, I don't want to sit in pain. So I'm always trying, I'm always ready to move on to, like, to the next thing. And I think, you know, the, the problem with that, of course, is you end up forcing these kind of premature conclusions. So I think it's like I had these ideas about resurrection before I'd really experienced some of that resurrection. And I think, for, and for me, this is part of the power of the story. I think part of the idea is you actually have to walk this road of grief, of descent, of ashes, in order to get to resurrection. So sometimes I think, and I mean, I'm not trying to be an armchair psychologist here, but I think anybody's had a good experience with therapy does this. Therapist's not gonna be like, oh, well, that's that's a bad feeling. Well, let's try not to feel that. Let me get, let me just give you this little nugget and let, let's move on. Why don't you think about something else? It's always gonna be deeper work than that. And often what it means is you have to go deeper into that pain deeper into that wound in order to, 
to find healing. So I think uh, what it looked like for me was a lot of that, was a lot of, oh, I thought I was ready to move on to this kind of new life, but I think there might still be a little bit more grieving to do. I think I might need to actually let myself feel some of this a little more deeply. And um, well, to use another resurrection image there, this idea of, of, of continuing to revisit the tomb. And some, sometimes you keep going back and you don't see anything, but I think it's still important to, you know, to do that. So I think that's a lot of what it looked like for me was pushing me into deeper and darker spaces in some ways, as opposed to just trying to skip to the, to the punchline, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It's just a great question. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. You, you kind of alluded to this, but for, for some, myself included, the, the road away wasn't necessarily from God. Mm -hmm. The road away was from the sacred space. Yeah. Um, and the loss of community yeah. to remain faithful. Um, what would your word of hope mm. be to those who, it, it's not a matter of faithfulness, but there's yes. a loss of hurt, pain, yes. of the community, the, the hope of being together is kind of gone. Yeah, yeah. But what would your word be for those of us like me? That's a great question. And I love, actually, I love even the first thing that you said, because I feel like that's worth acknowledging that, um, and again, I haven't had a, a lot of pushback on the title. I did see since, I guess we've had a few Facebook ads, that made me laugh seeing some of those, but I think I saw some of those, like, <laughs> sometimes like, this title's gonna bury this book. <laughs> I, thought that was, I thought that was great. But it is interesting, I mean, the title almost is a little tongue in cheek because the real truth is, I don't really believe that there's a road away from God. <laughs> like there's a road away from believing and experience and like that kind of thing, but a road away from God, like this idea is that you know, God's at the, at the center of the story, whatever we, uh, whatever we believe about God. So that, that, that's probably important to say. But more specifically to your question about the, because that, that's been my experience too, and for so many people that I care about, that loss of community, which I think realistically, is where, uh, and I think this is kind of how it's supposed to be, we, we do experience God in community. We do experience God through face-to-face -face with others uh, that are made in the image of God. So, and I think that's why it feels so catastrophic, you know, and for a lot of people it does end up ending in loss of faith, because really to lose your sense of community, which is always going to be tied to our identity, the people who told us who we are, well, now I'm not connected to them, well, then who am I? No wonder that for so many people that, that can lead to a loss of like absolute faith. Um, but I guess my encouragement would be, and this is, it's, it's so interesting how, and I, I, don't, I don't feel like I'm making this up. I don't feel like I'm just generating this. It's, it's, so, it's so present the story. The disciples are walking on this road and having what seems to be a deeply authentic conversation about the grief and the pain that they experienced and the loss of Jesus. And for me, it's profound that it's exactly, even while they're walking away from temple establishment, all those kinds of things, in the sharing of this grief and pain, Jesus comes alongside them. And I just can't think that's incidental. It's, it's almost like that in of itself becomes an accidental kind of church, which is an experience I feel like that we bear witness to a lot, like in the world, that whenever people break their pain open with somebody else, it's a deeply sacred experience. So anybody, uh, I've heard a lot of you know, people, for example, have done AA will often say that those are the most spiritual experiences that they've had. And I'll doubt that because it's so soulful and you're just opening yourself. So I do think there's something to this idea that when we share our grief, our pain, our trauma with another person, that is, it is an invitation. I know God's always present, but a conscious way for the presence of God, I think whether or not um, we're looking for that exactly, whether or not there's actually prayer. I think God just shows up in spaces where people get vulnerable, which is what's so sad about church sometimes is that if the idea is I think that the, the ground gets thinner, the more vulnerable we are. And then oftentimes we create these spaces, which is where people are the least likely to be able to get vulnerable of any space in their lives. Um, 
But I do, I do think, and I, and I see that happening. I see people who feel like they're on the margins of their own respective communities find each other. And in the sharing of that pain, something sacred happens. Something I do say later um, on, though, in the book, which is not, um, I don't, I don't mean to say it in a preachy way, but I have offered this as like the encouragement sometimes to um, some folks who are kind of on this kind of journey is that I do find it interesting, though, that by the time we get to kind of the end of all this, the new community, as it were, uh, that's built on the resurrected Jesus, they're also, I mean, it's also built on shared joy. And so I have found myself, again, when that's certainly a, a tightrope, because I don't want anybody to prematurely attempt to resolve their pain. But I think there is also this idea of like, okay, resurrection does come. And the question of where is their new life now? Because I think while pain can open up these kind of connections, I think sustained community has to be built on shared joy too. So again, I try to say, let's, to say that to folks in a way that doesn't feel preachy, hopefully, but just this idea of, okay, where is their new life happening now? And what would it look like to share that new life with other people? Because uh, I think that's where new community can happen. And um, I, I feel like actually what I hear from a lot of people right now, um, and again, no experience like this is totally universal, but you, you may never fully get over the pain of feeling alienated from sacred spaces that you held dear. That's, I mean, that is a deeply lonely, alienating experience. But it's interesting how many people I feel like I'm hearing say now that easily the richest experiences of community that they've ever had, they're having on the other side of that, precisely because it's coming from a more authentic space. And that makes, that does make me feel really hopeful, this idea that even though there might always be a, a, a bit of a sting that's there, um, that there, there's this new community and there's these friendships that can happen that actually are far more beautiful um, because they're more genuine. That's the thing. I think when you, the relationships you build on this road are, I mean, they are, they are genuine. When you share pain with somebody, when you share trauma, when you share grief, uh, that, that's real life. Um, yeah, I'm seven, so I generally try to avoid pain historically, but now I feel like I'm getting weird the other way because I'm almost like, uh, um, I, I want to cut right to like, okay, let's let's go ahead and talk about our most painful experiences. Because I, 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 I want a real thing to happen here, you know? And, and realistically, I think we do bond more over our failures and defeats and losses more than we do our, our victories. So, I, you know, I do think that's, that's what starts, but that's just Yes. So, you know, coming to a place to encounter God along the road, yeah. it can feel hard to then imagine that God still remained in Jerusalem. Yeah. Um, and yeah. like, you know, some of that's just the judgment mm -hmm. of like the reason why we left those spaces mm -hmm. is because there were spaces where we didn't feel we could be authentic or be accepted. Right. And, and now we're seeing God in these spaces and there's hope there. Um, but then it's like, oh, that's still back. Yeah, yeah. You know, I love everything about the way you're even articulating that. I think it's, that's such a real question. Part of what I'm coming to believe, and I know that especially for people who write in the, in the middle of the, the deepest part of that pain, that this is not something that you're always ready to hear, but it is what I've come to believe. It's kind of like embracing this idea, you know what, because I'm finding God here in this space now, doesn't mean God's not back there. And actually that's really important, this acknowledgement of like, no, yeah, no, God is, because I feel like often what will happen, you know, um, well, I'll put it like this, growing up, for example, in this very Pentecostal tradition, which was so oriented around the spirit. And I feel like still shapes me so much to this day. But I remember when I first started this journey of really seeing the power in communion, Eucharist, sacraments, those kind of things, the rhythm of that kind of like ordered prayer life. Then at first, I was like, well, where has this been all my life? This is amazing. God's not back there. God's here. And then I feel like I meet people all the time who come from these very sacramental spaces who get in a place where there's something of that 
wildness of the spirit that's embraced. They're like, oh, I'm not going back to this dead, dried up place. God is obviously over here. And I think there's something to that because almost sometimes I think it's like in that that's more other to us. It's like it jars us, I think, into the experience of resurrection. I think what it hopefully could look like to come full circle is seeing, though, that actually God is in all those spaces and uh, in, in different ways. And I feel like this has taken me a while to, to get to, and I still like I feel the need to qualify because I do think I do think some spaces are like incurably toxic. I do. I think some spaces are. I mean, it, it, things can go off the tracks in such a way where it's just not healthy. But, you know, the truth is, um, <laughs> I recorded a little podcast yesterday, and I'm, I feel like I'm such a, I don't need to be mad. I'm, I've, there, I'm in content generation mode. I, I put on my little headphones, and I like recorded a voice memo. I'm, like, I'm posting this podcast. And this was kind of the whole thing that I was going on about, really, is that, uh, Jesus in Luke 4, when he's reading from the prophet Isaiah, the famous text, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, uh, preach the gospel to the poor, release the captive, sight the blind, um, claim your Lord's favor, all that. I, I was just thinking about how, you know, I do believe that's how we recognize the spirit is that liberating presence. Are people getting free? Are people becoming, are people becoming whole, healed, integrated? Because uh, that, that's what it sounds like. And one of the things that I'm finding that's so interesting is that even when folks are still really entangled with toxic kind of systems, doesn't mean you don't ever stumble into the gospel. And it's, it's interesting how sometimes I feel like I will hear the, what for me is the word of God in the midst of otherwise like a complete mess. And I'll be like, whoa. 20 minutes of that ranting, I feel like it's like, that is very uninspired, but it's interesting how like there's that sound because everybody knows or um, on some level has had experiences of mercy. And I think like people like, it's interesting that how entangled you can still be in things that are toxic, but there are these moments you break out of it or you can see it in one area, not in another. So I'm just, I'm just really coming to a, a place for trying to embrace this idea that it really is possible for healing and harm to happen in the same spaces. And I feel like it's important to be able to say that because like otherwise, when everything has to be like all good or all bad, well, that's quite the roller coaster. Because then, you know, then when the people that we over idolize disappoint us or something, then, then that's it, it's up, it's over. Uh, but then it kind of works the uh, uh, kind of the other way too. It's like we get, because I've experienced grace in this space, then clearly nothing we're doing is wrong. Well, no, that's actually not, that, no. I was, um, I'm not, I'm not gonna name a name here on, on purpose, but I kind of, um, I was, well, I was watching a documentary not long ago and it kind of like, and I thought about a church situation where I was like, okay, a lot of this I feel like is, I, I, of course I resonate with this in terms of what's unhealthy about these spaces, but I also feel like it turned into like this very ominous, like, these sinister churches have partners all around the globe where they attempt to do missions to tell other people their message. And the way the big sound is kind of like clear, obviously this is all evil to the core and everybody's participating in all these systems of greed and oppression. And it's so I was like, I think that's a little unnuanced of a take. <laughs> Might also be possible <laughs> that there's good work happening with the poor and people having meaningful spiritual experiences and someone um, who was addicted, got their life cleaned up and great things are happening. And also there are some ways that, um, that, that these spaces are unhealthy in other ways. So again, I, I'm sorry, that was such a long way around, but I'm just thinking about that so much right now, this idea that like, okay, God can, God can be in that, but in a way that also still gives people permission to name the things that maybe God is not in. Oh, you know, God did not authorize that. That's not what God wants for you or God's heart for you in some way. Anyway, I hope that's it. Just sorry to over answer that. This is where my head and heart is right now. So, anybody else? Just thoughts. Anything else? Yes, please. Do you have a specific? 
wonderful quote from the book. Mm. A specific one. Well, that's just a kind way to word that question. <laughs> a specific wonderful quote. Good. How can you pick one? All you know? oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's funny how, like, in that moment, then my mind gets like, oh, I'm like, well, there's, like, pull quotes in this book. What, what was something I actually said? Um, <laughs> you know, I tell you, um, I don't know that, I don't know that it's necessarily all that um, profound, necessarily, uh, or maybe not for everybody else. But I just keep coming around to this idea of, um, and I feel like I say this a few different ways in the book, this idea that if God is on the road that you're walking now, then wherever you are is where you're supposed to be. And when I say that, I don't mean to say, because everybody knows what it is, but oh, well, I wish I wouldn't have done that. Uh, this is not the most healthy relationship. That was not the best decision or whatever. But I just so believe at this point that there is a way to be able to connect with God from wherever we are. And so if where I am right now, if this experience, even painful experiences, can lead me to a place of, yes. of, of humility, of openness, of tenderness, then what path then is, is, is the wrong path? Especially in a, like, to, to actually be kind of preach about it, to be sitting with Jesus now. If, if, if God is here and the, there's the possibility of resurrection in this moment, then even if there's been a lot of twisted turns, um, what, what is the wrong road if Jesus is walking the road with him? Uh, just that, that for me has been a really powerful idea because it gives, at least for me at least, it gives me a sense of permission of, okay, however I got here, um, there's a way to be able to connect with God where I, where I am. Uh, but I just, I just feel like we waste a lot of time and energy with the mental gymnastics of kind of how did I get here, uh, which again is where I think it's so much more redemptive, this notion of where is God, where I actually am now, may not even be exactly where I want to be, but where is God in, in the moment? Um, so yeah, that's the closest thing I've got to me, <laughs> a wonderful quote. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate y'all's time. It was a beautiful conversation.